Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the July Rust Game Dev Meetup. Um, there are going to be some interesting technical difficulties with this uh, this edition, just because I bricked my Windows install, and so I'm trying to do it from Arch, and there's some interesting graphical bugs. Um, but uh, I'll try to sort them out while stuff is happening. I think the thing is I have to like cut off the top part of the video, or else it like flickers a lot, just because of like, how the taskbar is working or something like that. Uh, but we'll try to work around it as best we can. Um, so, uh, for anybody who hasn't been here before, um, hi, I'm Forrest. I, uh, run this monthly meetup in which, uh, we come out and get together to show off the type of stuff we've been working on within the Rust game dev ecosystem over the past month. Uh, so it's an opportunity to kind of meet with other people who are working on, uh, cool stuff in the same scene and, uh, to just get connected. And so, uh, without further ado, we'll hop into the show and tell. We have a few different uh, projects to show off today. And I have a pretty special secret at the end that I'm pretty excited about. It's like a new thing that I want to try. Um, but we'll, we'll see what, what that comes up to at the end. Um, so uh, we'll be back in just a few seconds with the first, uh, the first show and tell. So first up, we have Fuchsia here to tell us a little bit about Cint and Custodian. Yeah, so um, I think it was last time that we had um, uh, Hey here to talk about color. Um, maybe it was two times ago. I think it was last time. So, um, he did a pretty, pretty great job of explaining, I guess, um, sort of why you might want to talk about more intricate details of, of colors. Um, so I won't go too much into detail about that, but I did want to do like a little basic introduction at least um, for people who aren't there or aren't familiar. Um, so in game dev, a lot of the times, um, especially for people who like aren't um, deep in color, basically, like, you know, colors are just like an RGB tuple. Um, the thing is, that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, so, like, the example I use is that uh, much like how a 3D vector um, you know, could be used for any of uh, the motion vector of an object, an object, um, or storing three random values that you would otherwise use in a character. Um, if you just have an RGB tuple, then you basically can't say pretty much anything about actually means. Um, you have to actually assign it some metadata uh, in order to, to know what you're actually talking about. So, um, color is a library that um, takes the approach or helps you manage colors by taking the approach that you should um, essentially uh, store the metadata yourself. Um, and, you, and uh, it takes in that media at runtime and um, converts between color uh, spaces. 
map metadata here. Um, so I'm going to try to get that figured out. I think it's my pulse audio that's being the problem. So I'm going to try switching it over to um, record it differently. But uh, just give me half a second to try and figure this out. Sure, no problem. Anybody's on Twitch, is my audio uh, the same as well? Just wondering. Yeah, it wouldn't be a meetup if we didn't have some sort of technical difficulty. Uh, I think I, I might try rebooting my computer. I was playing some games earlier that might have messed with it a little bit. I don't know if I can record anything that isn't Pulse Audio, which is a problem. Um, so I think I'm qu quickly going to do a computer reboot, which is going to kill the stream for a second. So my audio is fine on Twitch. Um, Fuchsia, can you just say a few things just to see? Yeah, sure. Testing one, two, three. <laughs> uh, is the audio still going to be spotty, or is it fine now? Wait, so people are saying Angel's audio is never... Okay, it's fine. Um, Fuchsia's good for me now. Okay, we're not going to change scenes. You're going to have to look at my video. But if it works, it works. <laughs> So you're good to go. Cool. Okay, so I think, let's see, I was at, uh, Color takes the, the approach that this metadata should be defined um, basically at runtime. And uh, it um, relies on, on the branch predictor and the fact that CPUs are really modern to, uh, to be fast. Um, but two things one, that, um, could be improved here, in my opinion, um, are that one, um, we can't get provably optimal code necessarily. We're relying on the branch predictor, which many times will probably work well, but sometimes it won't. Um, and especially on, if we're trying to run this on something like a GPU, uh, it's much less likely for that to be a good idea to, to be relied upon. And then also it doesn't do anything to help you um, actually catch like logic errors at compile time. Uh, and so to do both of those things, I created a library called Custodian, um, which is built on top of color. And it um, basically adds a bunch of, a, a layer of type safety on top of, of what color does. Um, and so by doing that, we can um, provide provably optimal uh, conversions between um, any color space and or a color in any color space and, and in any other one. And, uh, and also um, provide type checking that will help prevent logic errors at compile time. Um, so the way that works is uh, we have a color um, type, which is actually stores these two pieces of important metadata um, at compile time. So the first of those is the color space, um, which is a fairly nebulous term, um, but which we define as um, basically defining um, most of the metadata, which says where or what the color actually is, um, for an RGB color, that is the primaries, that is the white point, and that is the transfer functions. Um, however, we also support um, color spaces which aren't RGB color spaces, and so that changes a little bit for, for those color spaces. Um, and then there's also the color state, um, which is 
a concept that I haven't seen talked about um, a whole lot, especially outside of like cinema um, color management. And even then, it's not um, often like directly um, defined, especially in code. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about that at least. Um, so in in color science, you're basically the um, what you're trying to do with the metadata is provide a, a specific unit that you're measuring the color within. And so there's kind of two different distinct ways you can do this. You can either relate it to um, the the actual um, color metric values of colors being displayed on a, on an actual or a virtual display, um, which is the most common way to do it. It's how, for example, like the sRGB standard, which is by far the most common way to do color in games, um, is measured. However. Um, it's also possible to do this in relation to um, the input device. So this could be in in cinema. This would actually be like a, a real physical camera, which has been specifically characterized so that you know for that camera's combination of of sensor and processing, etc. You know exactly which code values deter correspond to what actual um luminance radiance in the in the real world and in the case of games what this would be is actually um in a 3d renderer the values that are um th that we collect for each pixel in our virtual camera um which are often in the quote unquote linear rgb uh color space which is actually underdefined and is usually the linear srgb uh color space Um, but it's also kind of a special version of the linear sRGB color space because it's um it's kind of like flipping the measurements on it on their head. And instead of defining it as like a function of how the color is displayed, it's actually recording like the the, the values based on um colors hitting a virtual camera sensor. <laughs> this seems like a bit of a pedantic like difference uh but it's pretty important because when you're measuring a color in terms of how it's displayed you have a finite dynamic range between zero and whatever the brightest and most saturated color that that display can display um but when you're measuring it in terms of an input device you have a basically theoretically infinite um, dynamic range. And so when you're trying to do quote unquote high dynamic range rendering with you know real world units, um, the you want to tr want to keep track of that difference because if you don't perform any conversion back to a finite uh, dis um, dynamic range, then you're bound to have your colors look very weird and off. Um, and so I'll, that'll be one of the, the things that I focus on a little bit later is um, the step that does that is called tone mapping. And uh, I think it's a little bit oft overlooked um, or seen as like a solved problem, just throw an existing thing at it, but um, there's definitely some issues. Um, so, With all that said, um, a very brief overview of how Colsodian works. Um, you can read this whole thing, which will hopefully go into more detail. But we have the color type, which um, has two generic parameters, which are the color space and the state, which is either display referred or scene referred. And then the color space is one of a bunch of um, spaces we define here. Um, and um, you can get to this a variety of different ways. You can um, 
There's some helper functions, or you can just do color new and define it as being in a certain um, color space to, to begin with, in which case the, the library kind of just trusts you. <laughs> um, but anything, once you actually have something loaded in, then um, it should all be type checked. And so the way that works is you can just call this dot convert method um, to another color space. So for example, this would be starting in nonlinear sRGB and then converting to a color space called Ocklab, um, which is a good choice if you want to blend between two colors. And so um, it's just one step and it's a provably optimal um, conversion between these two color spaces, even though they're um, not even both uh, RGB color spaces and they're um, both nonlinear. So, and then you can blend between them and, and then um, convert it back to an sRGB color that, that can be directly displayed. And so um, a, a small demo that I made um, to show that this works is this is the EGUI sort of like demo app thing. And I actually replaced the default color picker with one based on the um, Ocklab color space. And so um, in the place where you'd usually have this like um, default hue slider for sRGB, um, you have this much more perceptually even blend between different hues. And then the same thing from different from, from zero to full chroma. Um, one issue here is that this color space isn't actually necessarily great for directly using in a color picker like this because you can e easily go outside the uh, sRGB gamut. And that's where you get these like weird hue shifts um, outside of it. But in any case, um, it shows the idea of these colors are being displayed as sRGB. Um, but they're actually being computed and blended between um, in the Ocklab color space. So, and all of that is is um, type checked, et cetera. So you can't screw it up. Um, and that brings me to the second um, thing that I wanted to present, which is Cint. Um, which I hope um, many of you are familiar with the mint or mint crate, which is the mathematics interoperability. And cint is basically the same thing, but for colors. Um, so it's very unopinionated. It just provides a bunch of basically bags of components um, that carry their metadata as a type. And the thing this is useful for is interoping between different crates. So for example, when I was writing this um, EGUI app, um, since I implemented CNT support for both EGUI and Custodian, um, I can do this dot into CNT method, which basically converts, you know, this is a, at this point, this is a, a Custodian type. It's a color alpha, which is a Custodian type. And then into Cint, this turns it into a Cint type, and then into converts that into um, the EGUI type that is needed to actually work with EGUI itself. Um, so that's basically the concept of of Cint is that um, instead of all these libraries having to depend on each other, they can all just depend on Cint, and then you convert to that um, in order to go between them. Um, the last thing I wanted to show is um, one, I guess, benefit of of properly tracking your colors, which is um, doing tone mapping as like um, a thing to convert between scene and display referred colors. And uh, this this tone mapper that we provide in Colsodian. Um, that I call the perceptual tone mapper, and uh, it's based on it's it's my own code based on some concepts from um one of my coworkers Thomas Destechowiak. I'm butchering his name pronunciation, um, but super smart guy, 
And so I have a few, I guess, little, just little demos. So this is just a little test renderer. I don't know exactly how great this is going to come through on stream. Um, this uh, right here, you want to particularly look on these like very brightly colored balls, but but the whole thing in general. This is what a, a standard like tone mapper would look like. Um, this isn't um, aces or anything. This is just like a very basic S curve tone mapper. Um, and then this is the perceptual tone mapper. And you can kind of see that um, we regain a lot of like vibrance in the mid tone colors. And we also regain um, definition in the very saturated highlights. You can find um, gradation and a, a very controllable and neutral desaturation in the highlights. Um, Here's another screenshot. This is the basic one. This is the perceptual one. You can see where you get both more vibrance in the midtones and more definition in the highlights. And you can see that things get really bright. Um, the desaturated, they get bright. Um, to compare to a more industry standard, this is um, UE5, a scene in UE5. It uses ACES tone mapping. Um, this is in a um, a little hobby render from Tomas that uses um, the perceptual tone mapper. And you can see particularly in areas like this, like wood over here and the greens, you gain back, and, and also these blues, you gain back a lot of um, vibrance and also um, neutrality. Like you don't have a, a weird hue shift um, throughout the whole range. Um, here's just another small example. So, yeah, in any case, um, come check out Colsodian, and uh, if you write color libraries, then also check out Seant. Um, yeah, that's it. Awesome, super cool. I think uh, having listened to like, the color presentation as well, uh, there's definitely a lot that I learned about kind of like the behind the scenes of what a lot of this is actually doing. But I think one of like the, the best demos you showed there was your like the color picker. Like you could really see the, the place where it's capping because it can't represent the proper, uh, uh, well, like it, it just represents it differently. And uh, so yeah, I think that was a pretty cool visual way of looking at yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one thing I'm wondering is when it comes to implementing these uh, sorts of things in games, let's say like I, I make my like model in Blender or something like that and add whatever materials I like and then I import it into my game. Um, would a lot of this color work be done uh, in some type of shader or somewhere else in the pipeline? Um, so so um, I go into a little bit of, um, of detail or like a basic example in this um, in this overview page on the docs. Um, but the basic idea is that when you load in an asset, um, you'll be doing some of the work. So the, the asset will probably be stored in um, perhaps sRGB um, is a very common way to do that. So at that point, when you actually load the asset, you probably want to convert it to a working color space. Um, so a good, in my opinion, uh, a good, um, way thing to convert it to is the ACES CG color space. Um, and if you send all your colors in the ACES CG color space to a shader, um, then you can just know that they're all in ACES CG to begin with. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, you to do probably most of your work without um, converting to another one. And then you to do the tone mapping within the shader to convert from um, ACES CG to in a scene referred context to a splater referred context and also back to um actually probably srgv to actually be displayed on the seat on the, the the monitor itself um within within a shader um and colsodian it's not tested um fully yet but it's been created in such a way that it should work um perfectly with um, Rust GPU, and if it doesn't yet, then it will soon because uh, we'll be using that within 
um, our internal stuff at Embark. So nice, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm excited to see the progress on this, and I think especially if it can be like a lot more, like it, it, like when I'm building something in whatever game engine, Bevy, Amethyst, whatever. If I can just have this type of stuff front and center, I think it'd be a very valuable tool for sure. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Fuchsia, and I hope to see more about this in the future. Yeah, thanks so much. So next up, we have Eclisma here to show us uh, a little bit about RAFX. Yeah, so this month I spent most of the time on the asset pipeline and figuring out how to get content loaded, because I think I've put a lot of emphasis on the just you know getting it to work and the API design and performance, but um, I think it's important to have more realistic scenes to make sure that the focus is being put on the right places as far as performance goes, or also, just the fact that um, yeah, it doesn't matter if you have a good render if you can't load content into it. So um, I've got a bunch of videos because I wanted to show a, a variety of things and um, I'll go through it pretty quickly. So this is um, exported from Blender through a custom plugin and um, then loaded through the asset pipeline in Rafix. There is some it, there's some shadow acne and the frame rate's not great, but um, you know this is like. These are things that can be fixed, and um, it's good to have content that, like the shadow acne, I didn't know it was doing that because in the testings I had before, they were a lot simpler, so they didn't have the same angles of light and things, so it's good to uh, have scenes like this that show that that needs more tuning. The uh, fly-through camera here is, I did this in Blender and then exported JSON with um, uh, just XYZs and rotation. and um, and it was pretty quick to set up, so I'll show that in a little bit. Um, I also worked on a, uh, I mentioned the plugin. In addition to exporting, there's also a uh, mechanism for working on very large scenes um, and, and doing this with JSON files instead of saving it in Blender. The problem with Blender is that everything's binary, so you can't diff it if something um, changes. Like if you've got a team of people and they change the same thing, it's uh, problematic. So, um, actually, I don't think this was the video I meant to show. Sorry about that. I don't. <laughs> well, it's still neat. <laughs> um, sorry, let me see if I can find that video. I'll show. Yeah. Just while you're looking for that, I do agree. It'd be yeah. very cool if we could diff stuff in uh, in Blender. That'd be very neat. Okay, I think this is the correct one. So, um, the way it works is there's a there's a I'll save it first because it, it needs paths, and having it saved somewhere, it looks um, up the directory chain just like a .dot git file. Like that tells you where the base of a git folder is. I have a .dot graphics project file that tells you where the base of your project is and it says where your asset directory is and where your art directory is. So um, that's how it knows where to put files. Because I didn't want, uh, one of the problems with exporting is you have to answer all these questions and pop-ups and it's not, I want to hit export and it puts in the right place with the correct settings. So um, anyways, this is a large scene and um, I started with a big JSON file with everything in it uh, that I generated with some Python scripts and using some um, uh, a big FBX that I wrote some scripts for to, to kind of convert out. Um, so I'm going to split this into a bunch of separate slice files, which are just bits of JSON. And what this will allow, it allows a few things. For one, um, you don't have to load the entire scene anymore to work with a part of it. 
So that's great because um, a large scene at some point Blender is going to hit a limit. Um, so this means you can have a theoretically as large of a, a world as you want, like open world type of size. Um, it means that multiple people can work on different parts without having merge conflicts. And um, not just in terms of like what area of the map, but also if you want to split your lighting into one file and your audio emitters in another file and other things in other files, it would mean that a team with different disciplines can work together with, even if it's in the same area of the map, without having merge conflicts. So um, this is just showing that I'm moving pieces of the map into individual slice files, and then those will all get saved out in, in different files. So I'll skip this forward a bit. Um, yeah, so. So it's taking out pieces of the world, and obviously it's a lot easier to work with when there's a much smaller scene loaded. So you click the slice file once you have things selected, and you say to move it, and then you unload it, and then that saves it to the JSON. And at the end, I show that you can turn on all the different pieces by themselves. So I've removed the big slice file and now you can just pop in the things that you want to look at. Um, so a, another long-term benefit of this is that in the future, instead of reading and writing from a file system, this could be reading and writing from um, a, database or a database. It could be reading and writing from an engine that's communicating by socket. So um, that would let a... Um, you could load an engine that's playing the game uh, and have Blender open live, move things around in Blender, and see the results immediately rendered in Engine, which is great because uh, Blender's render isn't obviously isn't going to give you a pixel perfect um, equivalent to what your game engine will look like. So having them both open at the same time is an advantage. And graphics supports um, hot loading to devices, so this would also let you have a phone running on the side, and you could move things around in Blender and then see results. So this is, there's some rendering issues here, um, but I wanted to show this because this shows that, and it's, it's a very short video because I, I wanted to be able to put on Discord, but um, it, this shows that um, Rafi is handling multiple gigabytes of data, and um, even if it fills the GPU, it's, uh, it works, and yeah, it didn't at first, so it was good to uh, prove that out, which Again, I think loading of real scene is important. Um, and then I messed around a bit with Houdini this month also. Um, Houdini lets you do procedural geometry. Um, the way this one, I, uh, I'll try to load it, but I was a little bit afraid of it was going to crash or do something weird. So just in case it does, I'll, I'll have the screenshot. But what you see here is these nodes on the bottom right. And um, they they have different instructions to normally you would be extruding things or insetting things or beveling things um and this is just a set of operations that runs in sequence um and the benefit of doing it this way is that you can have i'm, I'm clumsy with with uh Houdini, so did it did it crash i think it crashed so that's a good thing i have a screenshot Anyways, um, you can move the, there's, this is actually a curve with six or seven points on it. Uh, and so if you move the curve around, then it, it regenerates all the geometry for you. Um, and I'm going to try one more time. And if it does, yeah, I think it crashed. So, yep, that's a good idea. Anyways, uh, that can be exported as an OBJ and brought into Blender. So I think the ideal workflow here would be if you need to do something procedural, you could generate like five different types of barrels with different sizes or um, different like variations. You could generate like telephone poles with different heights and different numbers of beams on them or buildings with different floors. Blender has something called geometry nodes, but it's very new. It does some of the same ideas, um, but it's just not going to be as far along as Houdini because this is kind of Houdini's calling card is that it, it does these types of things. So uh, I haven't been looking at chat, so yeah. Were there any questions? 
Um, one thing I'm sort of wondering about, just for clarification, is uh, so you mentioned that you took any any shapes or anything that were inside of Blender and then exported them to JSON in the FBX format. Uh, so correct? yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, the way it's set up is probably should have started with this, but I've got I've got two folders here: an art and an assets folder. The assets folder has um, a few, has it divided up in a few things. Um, these are where the oh, I'm sorry, this is I'm tripping over my words. The art folder is the source data, and the assets folder is where things get exported to. So if I go into the art folder and I look at this one, um, the level files are all here. They're sliced up into small JSON files. Um, I'm naming them dot slice, but it's just JSON. Um, the level, the, um, I've got two folders here with different sets of assets. Um, so I've got a materials.blend file, which has every material that's being used. I've got a bunch of textures, and then I've got a bunch of models. The way I set up the models is, um, let me find a larger one that would have LEDs in it, which I don't support LEDs rendering right now, but... Uh, obviously, that would be the plan. Is that? Uh, let me make sure you, this is not on the sides. Of this. So um, you can see there's different collections here, and these collections are different meshes, and they would be different LEDs. So you can switch between the LEDs. You can see LED three um, would have less geometry than LED zero. Mm -hmm. So um, when this gets exported which should be in the demo folder, sorry, the assets folder. This is actually why I have a custom exporter is because um, cause I wanted to make sure that, like if you export all stuff with GLTF, um, it's going to duplicate the textures in every GLTF file. Or you're going to have to, uh, if you have them as external folders, then you're exporting the textures many times. Even if, if you put in the same place, you're exporting it, the texture, a bunch of times per model onto the same .png or .jpg or whatever. So um, this goes out as like dot, as these mesh files and model files. The model files is just a JSON that points to the mesh. The mesh is binary. So this is all, this is, um, the JSON is just like locations and rotations of things. I see. I, I think your uh, your idea of having sort of like that hot reloading directly from Blender to uh, RefX is a pretty interesting kind of concept. Um, and so like with your proof of concepts that you've had so far, have you seen like it been able to work? Uh, I haven't gotten the hot reloading of a entire slice running in, in Blender and, and the game. Um, but I've had other like demos and prototypes that did. Yeah, and um, I haven't really tried to put together a big scene myself. I'm mostly importing data that I know is, um, you know, like large enough to be interesting, mm -hmm. and just running it without doing much changes. I, I mean, I've moved things around a bit, and re-export, and made sure that they went through the pipeline properly. But as far as like experiencing the workflow from beginning to end to actually build something, I haven't done that yet. I I'm I'm super excited to be able to see that though because I think it's uh like that 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 kind of thing where you have like um everything hot loading real time and you have like your blender as your editor and you're in game and you can kind of change stuff and uh, like as you see it through your entire graphical pipeline would be a uh, like a super interesting tool to have I've never really thought of doing that with Blender in particular. So yeah, that's and pretty cool. To, to be clear, I don't think Blender doing Blender this way is necessarily the ideal solution. It's just that reproducing a level editor. Um, is a lot of work. Yes. And I think that this is a happy middle ground where you get a lot of value without near the amount of time invested to do it. Yeah. And because it's a JSON, instead of binary .blend files, there is a path here. You can migrate out to having tools that are in-game that can manipulate things and, and save the JSON back out. So you'd be able to round trip the JSON back and forth between Blender and, uh. um, and the game. So eventually, once you have tools in the game and you don't need to use Blender for level editing anymore, then you know you just stop using it. And uh, I think the format of a bunch of JSON files for just like 
positions and rotations of things is a, a sound place to start for um, it representing what's in a what's in a level. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. All right, well, thank you for showing off Rafax again this month, and I'm excited to see you in the future. Sure. So next up, uh, Kvark can't be here this month. However, he did record a, another video for us about uh, what is going on with uh, WGPU HAL. Dmitry Malisho, the lead of WebGPU project. And uh, I'd like to tell you about the new exciting thing we have. It's a hardware abstraction layer. Uh, we touched a little bit on this last month where I said we're going to be moving JeffXRS into WGPU repository and changing it in some way. So this is what it, this is the result of it, largely. The talk is going to be split in three parts. And we're going to start with the why part. Why another graphics abstraction? Technically, it's a successor to JFX Hall, but it is mostly written from scratch. And instead of trying to target a Vulkan API, it targets WebGPU API. And the main difference between those is that WebGPU tries to be most efficient while not as powerful. So it has a smaller scope and it is everything that it has are very efficient to be translated to other APIs. So at, at any point, if you're using um, WGPU HAL, it means that you're getting things fast. We tolerate absolutely no overhead in it. Um, the, all the resource tracking, the lifetime tracking, state transitions are all done in the WGPU core, which is above the hardware abstraction layer. And uh, we want it to be written totally in Rust. In JFX, we started off um, without any shader infrastructure, and uh, we adopted Spear V Cross at some point, and we had a lot of issues with this. So we started migrating to Naga, and in WGPU hardware abstraction layer, we're just coding it specifically for Naga and only Naga. It means it's only Rust. It's uh, easier to build and debug. Finally, uh, in terms of safety, uh, it has a concrete API boundary, but it's fully unsafe. It doesn't check anything because we don't want any overhead, uh, but we still want it to be sort of usable the users. I mentioned the reduced scope. Um, it interestingly cherries types with WGPU core, which means we need to do less conversions on the way. And it, it tries to be simple. It tries to not be over-engineered like GFX Hall. And, and this is the example of it. Um, GFX used a lot of iterators and uh, generics to, this is not the recent GFX, but at some point uh, it used all those bound, generic bounds. Um, and uh, it tries to be overly generic in order to reduce overhead, but we understand that this type complexity has a cost in itself. So in WGP Hall, we try to be very simple. So we only use iterators where it is uh, hot code and otherwise we just we're just happy with slices and we pass objects by reference uh, let's talk about internals a little bit um, the API is designed as a, a number of traits which is very similar to JFX Hall but it's not similar to another graphics abstraction um, out there graphics binding model um, matches WebGPU and it's very similar to Vulkan, where um, you 
have the same um, groups of resources and you define the layout of them ahead of time and you bind them in the command stream and there is this thing called the pipeline layout which uh, defines all those groups together we also have the group IDs and binding IDs within the groups just like Vulkan just uh, with a different name on it uh, unlike Vulkan we bind them individually this also um, preserves the Vulkan pipeline compatibility rule uh, which allows us to implement it efficiently so the WGPU core which sits on top of it uh, respects the compatibility rule and sometimes have to rebind some of the bind groups that you previously bound but at the uh, GFX uh, WGPU HAL level again we tolerate no overhead so we're not rebinding anything we have passes we have both uh, render and compute passes just like WebGPU uh, and um, passes are um, scoping the bindings and the states so there is no um, binding state outside of the pass this is my favorite part perhaps um, these are the states of the textures that we have and all of the transitions of those states have to be explicit in uh, WGPU HAL, which means the user specifies the transitions just like they do in uh, Vulkan or D3D12. The beauty about this is that these states are actually defined in the WebGPU specification because the specification needs to define rules about how these states can be compatible or not compatible with each other. So these are taken straight from specification they were already a part of the WGPU core, so now they are just moved down and used explicitly by the user instead of being derived automatically. The main rule about the states is that you can um, put a resource into a combination of read-only states or in a single mutable state, which is very close to what you would do in Rust anyway. Um, forgot to mention that this, this state um, bit flags uh, can be very well translated into D3D almost one-to-one -one, and also to Vulkan so it's a it's a nice abstraction okay. in terms of data transfers we support buffers buffer mapping and persistent mapping um, we do the copy operations on the command buffer uh, nothing too fancy like we don't have any right buffer, right texture that uh, WebGPU proper has. Um, this is, these are all layered on top. Um, one interesting aspect is that our copies have to be aligned and uh, they work with a single texture array layer so that these are the things that allow us to translate it efficiently on the APIs. Command pools is another my favorite. Um, Vulkan command pool is different from D3D command pool and in general it's hard to come up with an API that would be efficient for both so we found this pattern where um, a command encoder would be able to record commands and then at the end of recording it would spew a command buffer for you which you can use only once um, then you can record another command buffer and another command buffer and after a while you may want to uh, reset the whole thing to reclaim all the resources associated with this command encoder um, so you give it back all the command buffers this is matching the uh, d3d12 command allocator very closely and also uh, mapping very well to Vulkan so I think it's a it's a good find in the API space that we have it was a pleasure to implement on all of the backends and it's quite nice to use as well we also have um, shader modules uh, which you create before creating the pipelines and the interesting thing about them is uh, you can pass um, Naga modules directly so if you for example write your shaders in GLSL you can um, 
hook up Naga and parse GLSL into a Naga module and then give it to WGPU Hall. We have uh, different types of queries and uh, we have surfaces that can be presentable. And this I don't want to call it a swap chain because there's no chain there. You, you get one uh, renderable texture and you render into it and then you give it back at a time. The current state, uh, we have well-functioning Vulkan, Metal, and even OpenGL ES3 backends um, with some limitations, the, the last one. Um, I'm currently working on D3D12 and um, we also want to extend OpenGL S3 into WebGL2, of course, to target not just WebGPU, but also WebGL. In terms of stats, every backend takes around 5,000 lines of code, which is approximately twice as less and as GFX REST backends do. Um, the code is readable and nice to maintain. Performance-wise, we were testing things on the uh, thing that it's called like bunny mark where uh, we draw a bunch of sprites and before each one we rebind uh, some group of resources with a different dynamic offset so that they are different and uh, we measure how many sprites we can fit into 60 fps basically and it turns out we can output twice as more sprites on the machines that i tested um, comparing to wgpu core because we have no overhead for tracking anything. That's it for the presentation. I just also wanted to quickly run, this is the WGPU example running on metal. Um, that's pretty much it. Oh, the, the slides were made into in Rusty slides with default theme. Uh, Thanks everyone, please uh, find the um, neighbor WebGPU team member to ask questions. Thank you. Oh, frick. Wait, how's my... Oh no, what are we watching now? Uh-oh. How to turn my webcam back on? Is it not this? Oh, it's because that's... Uh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Uh, yes, okay, every round of applause for Quark. Always working on the uh, super low-level stuff. That is very awesome. Um, I think I, uh, Quark mentioned you can ask questions. I think uh, CW Fitzgerald in uh, the Discord might know some of the stuff about uh, WGPU. Um, but, I mean, it's always fun to see uh, what's going on in... Uh, the the world of of graphics. All right, we'll be back in just a second with graphite.
So next up, uh, we have Keevan and True Doctor here to tell us about what has been going on in the graphite world this month. All right. Yes, in the last month, we've made a good amount of progress. Um, so just a brief overview in case you're new. Uh, what is graphite? Graphite is starting out as a 2D image editor that will support both raster and vector, although early on just vector. Um, basically aiming to be tooling for the game industry as well as all other sorts of things that use 2D. If you're using Photoshop or Illustrator, you're probably going to eventually find that Graphite is helpful to your workflow. Um, it also integrates non-destructive ideas uh, based upon a node graph to be able to um, to be able to make all of your artwork very non-destructively as opposed to baking all of your work into pixels. Um, and then eventually it will become an asset pipeline, a node-based asset pipeline that you can use for all sorts of things, ranging from um, 2D vector to 2D raster to potentially even 3D someday, or potentially even audio or different future applications. It would be pretty um, able, relatively able to support a large number of things. It's basically a Rust-based visual programming environment uh, for asset pipelines. But starting out with just 2D vector stuff and then 2D raster after that. Um, so updates this month. So we started out by being able to add, uh, have multiple documents open at the same time. You can switch between tabs and work on separate documents. Um, you can now do layer selection in the viewport by clicking and uh, dragging around layers, and you're able to select multiple layers directly from the viewport instead of having to click in the layer panel on the, on the layers that you have selected. Uh, we've got layer deletion and duplication and copy and paste. You also now can um, uh, transform the position of layers. We have support for that in the back end, and that also empowers you to transform around the entire document, and you can actually um, pan around the document now. Uh, we now have custom styles for our scroll bar, which matches the design. We have a, a bunch of code that went into cleaning up some of the front end. And we also now have checkbox widgets in the front end that allows us to um, enable and disable things, although those are not hooked up at the moment, but they do show up um, with custom icons for things that will match the design. Um, and finally, we have a warning that Safari is unsupported because they currently do not support all the APIs that we require. All right, and now we've got True Doctor to discuss. Uh, yeah, you, you can just go, go back one slide just to give me a bit of room for introduction. Sure. So, um, yeah, we've talked a lot about the concept of this node graph, and we like somehow now is like the time <clears throat> that we actually have to think about it and develop a design. And it's quite a difficult feat to achieve because it we basically want the node graph to be extendable and future proof. And making something future proof is I think he's uh, gone for a second here. He'll be back, I believe it. Maybe his computer crashed, that's always a possibility. That does sometimes happen, but I will, I guess, fill in in the moment. Um, we have, uh, basically, we are designing some of the... Sorry, oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> you're just about to describe future-proofing something. Yeah, future-proofing, future, future proofing. that's important. And, um, well, um, we figured, why not just make the whole thing Turing complete? Then it will be future-proof by design. Now you can look at the slide. So what we basically figured out is that we want to implement some sort of a, a functional visual programming language. And each of these nodes that you can currently see is a function. So we have, like at the bottom, starting with the circle, we have a unit function that only that takes no input and returns a unit circle as a vector shape. Then we have one function that takes vector data as an input and returns pixel data as an output. And we have a composer node that composes different sorts of pixel data together and ultimately returns pixel data as an output. And we can then render that to the screen or, or place displayed on the screen. And this allows us to do some pretty neat stuff. For example, we can seamlessly integrate multiple 
data types. We don't have to worry about defining data types upfront because they can even be user defined. And we can even implement, we can even add things like 3D models. So you can, let's say you are designing a poster and you have a 3D render on your poster. And then you decide, ah, I don't like the angle I want to show it from somewhere else. Then you can just go in Graphite, you can then just tweak the 3D rasterizer node, change the camera angle, and you don't have to go into Blender and um, take a new screenshot and make a new render because you can just do all that stuff in one application because we can then just import the 3D data as a model and have a rasterizer node that basically just implements a, a 3D renderer, which then is composed in the regular flow. And one thing that's actually very cool from a user experience uh, standpoint is that you can actually click on your 3D model in your view uh, in the layer panel. So the actual 3D model will be in the layer panel, and then you can adjust parameters on it. For example, if you might have a um, you might have a sub a subdivision surface modifier applied to the model, and you can just change that directly in the viewport, and you can switch between a low poly and a high poly um, uh, one by clicking on the 3D model as a layer, and it will just go back and render the entire 2D poster. One other thing that's pretty neat is that we can now like things like arbitrary data input. So you can, on the left, I drew a, a CSV file. You can add things like spreadsheets in there and use that use the data present in the spreadsheet to do processing and use it as input for nodes. For example, now we have this data.csv with a blend mode inside, which then dictates the blend mode for the composition. You could also provide a, like a, just a configuration file. Let's say you are a YouTuber and want to generate thumbnails with a certain schema, then you can just input a CSV file and it will automatically generate the thumbnail based on the parameters you specify, which is also quite neat. Um, to implement all this is quite a bit of work and it should ideally be user extensible and extendable. That's why we, it, it started out as a kind of joke, but now we are pretty much committed to it. Each node is a Rust function and it's fully transparent. If you click on a node, you can zoom in. Next slide. Let's, for example, take the circle node. The circle node in of itself, uh, I forgot to draw the lines in between, but this, the circle node in of itself is just a composition of different nodes. It's yeah, like a Bezier yeah. curve. It is a transform to transform it on the document canvas. We have a color modifier. And you can basically dig deeper until you reach the actual Rust code. You can click on a node, basically zoom in until you get to the code which you can also then modify. We will, for now, it will be mostly pre-built functions, but in the end, when we have the de desktop version, even in the resin version eventually, you will be able to write Rust code in Graphite, which is then compiled and dynamically linked into your application. So we dynamically build the node graph as Rust code, compile it and execute it to also leverage compiler optimizations and speed. It will be a bit challenging to get everything to work, especially in the current state with WebAssembly, because dynamic linking is not well supported yet. But it is, it is for sure an interesting journey, and I'm very much um, happy to participate in it. Yeah, and off to the queue again. Yeah. Um... And one more thing to add is that uh, the actual rendering of both the vector and the raster uh, data types are actually defined in the nodes. And there will basically just be one ginormous node used for rendering each of those two different data types. And then those will end up showing up to the user um, in the viewport automatically, um, just thanks to those nodes. So the data types, if you're doing raster or vector or even 3D or even audio or something, um, all of those different data types are basically defined by the node. And as a result, since you can write your own uh, Rust nodes using your own Rust data types, you can actually have your own application-specific um, 
usage um, or, or rendering, you could render something like signed distance fields or um, any other sorts of thing that you might imagine that either outputs directly to raster um, in the viewport or it is exported to a file, like if you're exporting an OBJ for a 3D model, or if you are processing some sort of uh, scientific data set and exporting it to some different format, or even exporting to a PDF with your final report based upon that scientific data. Um, all of those are different possible outputs uh, based upon how the nodes are implemented. Uh, it basically and is just a functional language that is a visual programming language for linking together Rust functions, um, but it's built with the intention of being a 2D image editor. And it has the user experience um, to basically use tools to manipulate the node graph for you. So if you are not familiar with nodes, you actually don't have to touch it. You get to uh, use the nodes like it's a layer panel. And also um, what you're seeing here in these diagrams, they are drawn more like a data structure as um, more, more of a design consideration. Although from a user experience standpoint, the nodes will look a little different because some things like vector rasterizer happens automatically. That's done uh, implicitly. Um, from the user experience, or, you know, from the user standpoint. And then also the actual node graph will be upside down from what you're seeing here in the way that um, the data flows from top to bottom in the way that you read um, you read data flow, same way that Houdini does it, for example. Um, but you're seeing it here like a, like a, a tree from a data structure standpoint. And also one pretty neat thing is that we will try to facilitate interaction. Um, the with the node setup, it is, and even with the being able to write Rust code directly in Graphite, it is very easy to manipulate, manipulate code, manipulate, it, manipulate nodes, so basically fork nodes, and also to import new nodes, write new nodes, and we want to, well, we basically want community interaction, so Everyone who uses Graphite and knows a bit of Rust can just very simply write nodes, and that also makes it's like the essence of open source. And we want to make it as easy as possible to contribute. Yeah, we might even have a button to say like open a pull request for this uh, for this node, so that way Graphite can come with a lot of very useful nodes out of the box. And if some are not supported, people can add their own and then open up a pull request very easily. Um, so. Yeah that uh, anything else for doctor to mention about this uh this technical discussion otherwise we can move on to additional uh, additional parts of the presentation yeah i think we if there are some questions we can answer them but for now yeah that could be left for the end um so just a quick update now on the ui implementation progress this was what it looked like a month ago and now for comparison it looks like this uh, this month, not too much has changed because a lot of the work has been going into the back end and the front end work has mostly um, plateaued in terms of it being already mostly implemented, at least at an early stage. Um, if you just want to compare, we added some uh, added some checkbox buttons up here, and um, we also now have proper support for multiple tabs, and you'll see that during the demo, which is going to happen right now. OK, so this is the live demo here. Um, we can go ahead and create shapes, except that was a white shape. I will switch that to a black shape now, and then I will switch it to a red shape. And um, first thing to demo is multiple documents. So you could just switch between them like this. Um, and then next is uh, layer selection in the viewport. So if we use the Select tool, we can actually drag a box around both of these and all three layers, including the white box that I'll just delete. I just deleted that with a delete key. Um, and then you can additionally make more shapes. And then go ahead and you could just click on the shape. Or you can drag a box around the shapes. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned, you can delete them. But what you can also do is you can copy it. And then I'm going to delete it. And I'm going to paste. Um, oh, that seems to actually not be working at the moment. It normally works, but it might be a bug. But if you copy it, and then, OK, apparently that's not currently working, but it used to. Um, you can also, you should be able to duplicate, although that appears to be broken at the moment also. So uh, it did work. We'll have to figure that out. 
Um, and then finally we have, or not finally, but next we have layer and document transforms. So it's actually possible to move the entire document around and uh, pan around the document. And then additionally, each of these layers have their own transforms, although currently it's not possible to drag them around. That will be um, an additional feature that will be coming next month. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? We have custom scroll bars. So we now have this nice looking scroll bar here. It's very fancy. It matches up with the design um, and the design aesthetic of Graphite and its, uh, its design language. It is better than the default, gra uh, the default scroll bar that came with the browser, which was too wide and doesn't match up at all. Um, we now have these checkboxes here. And those will be used similar to how Blender has the overlays toggle and the gizmos, or the, um, yeah, the gizmos toggle. These will be for toggling overlays, toggling the grid, and toggling uh, the snapping. And then additionally, if you use the drop down or, or the popover menu, you'll be able to make fine adjustments to specific what types of specific snapping or what types of grids to show or what types of overlays to show. Um, and then finally, we have a warning that Safari is unsupported because they don't have support for the necessary APIs that we require at the moment. However, they are apparently being added. I can't show you that warning because um, I'm not on Safari, but uh, it basically covers up the screen and says, um, please be aware that things won't be working, but you can still play around with the UI even though it will be non-functional. Um, so that is, I believe, everything from the demo this month. And... Um, now I'd like to show a quick sneak peek of something coming next month. This is support for full-on navigation of everything. So what you can do is, as I mentioned before, you can, um, you can pan around the document, but you can also now, uh, coming next month, you can rotate around the document anywhere. You can smoothly scroll, or you can use the scroll wheel to scroll. Uh, to zoom in. Um, you also can... Um, True Doctor, do you remember the other things you can do in this branch? Uh, unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> uh, I do have a checklist. Let me look at this checklist. I do like the uh, the smooth scroll. I think that looks uh, very smooth in comparison to what I'm used to with other. Uh, yeah, yeah that's by holding shape. down the control key and then using the middle mouse buttons and move up and down. That way you get really fine control. Yeah. Oh, yes, I forgot. You can also then um, you can increase and decrease with these buttons, or you can type in a value like 50% or 500%. Um, you can also then change the rotation with this value here. Like I want to go to 90 degrees. Um, and then you can still see that updated live as you spin. Uh, you can zoom in with these buttons, zoom out with these buttons, and reset the zoom to 100% with that button. And again, you can continue to use the rotate widget as well. So I believe that is all of the different features that will be in this branch. And that will actually be merged pretty soon, in the next few days. Um, but it did not make it into this branch, unfortunately. And yes, that is the end of the live demo segment. And I just wanted to shout out to some excellent artwork by the community so far. Uh, Billy DM created the amazing um, cherry tree artwork, and that was the winner of the first graphite art, art contest. Um, and that was posted to our Twitter account. If you don't follow us on Twitter, feel free to do so. Um, it is at graphite editor. Um, additionally, we have this beautiful castle by Norgate, and uh, we have a Reimplementation, I guess you could call it, of Mona Lisa um, by Spire Dies Yelling. And then finally, Norgate also created this um, reimplementation of the Scream. I uh, would also like to welcome our new community members, Till Arnold and Gaston Butt, and also potentially you if you'd like to join us. Uh, we could definitely use some help uh, continuing to increase the rate at which we are progressing with new features. And uh, quickly, I would like to mention that the goal uh, in terms of the roadmap for the next couple months is we would like to implement a bunch of new art features um, for the next month and basically remove all the pain points for 
um, creating art. We want to use the we want to implement the pen tool so you can make arbitrary Bezier curves. Um, and we want to be able to use the um, uh, we, we want to be able to make it so you can move layers around and rotate and transform them um, and potentially add snapping either this or next month as well. Uh, and that will pretty much make it so you can do most things. Oh, and also add text support as well. Um, and all of those together should make it so it's relatively unencumbering to uh, to implement or uh, to create artwork of of most types in terms of basic graphic design and logos. Um, and at that point, we're going to be releasing Graphite 0.1, which will be the first official um, beta release and or first, basically the minimum viable product release. Um, and then we will be promoting that to the wider community around the Rust ecosystem and the graphic design ecosystem um, and the technical art sort of community. And that is going to be coming either at the end of the next, the upcoming sprint, which is sprint six, um, or if it still needs some additional work, then it might be sprint seven. But in the next one or two months, we will be releasing the minimum viable product. Um, and then coming right after that will be support for, for uh, the node system and basically adding non-destructive editing to vectors, uh, to vector. Uh, to vector art, which will be a very unique feature, because I don't think there are really any other mainstream uh, vector editors that support node-based editing. Um, so without further ado, are there any questions? All right. I think uh, one here, uh, uh, someone asks, uh, have you studied like how Houdini works when it comes to, like um, uh, I suppose, like um, node-based stuff for like 3D data, in this case, like point clouds, vertices, and polygons? Um, yeah, so there would be sort of the 2D equivalent for vector-related uh, things, which is just the Bezier. Well, it's actually more of a stack of Bezier curves because you'll have multiple on top of each other. Um, and that is going to be the basic data type. But even a more primitive data type will actually just be points. And that will be useful, for example, if you want to do point instancing, um, similar to how that works in Houdini. Or you can use that for creating splines. Um, there will be a sort of a hierarchy of data types that um, implement one another, or that um, sort of are increasing levels of fidelity over one another. So the most basic is a point, and then you've got potentially an array of points, which is a point cloud, and then you've got um, a Bezier curve, which is a sequenced uh, order of those, where some of those are control points and some of those are um, are anchor points. And then um, you've got also on the vector side, I'm sorry, on the raster side, you have um, basically just a compositable resolution agnostic um, raster data type. So you can zoom in forever, and whatever is providing that raster data, whatever node upstream is providing that, it will just render it at a higher resolution. Unless you're import importing a, a bitmap, in which case that bitmap is also a data type of its own. And obviously, that won't be infinite resolution because you're importing it from a file. Um, but you can choose on the node that rasterizes that bitmap um, and turns it into something that is resolution agnostic. Uh, you can choose the interpolation mode, so you can go between nearest neighbor or bilinear or potentially even some AI upscaling algorithms in the future and basically sample from that texture at, um, a at uh, with an algorithm of your choice, an interpolation algorithm of your choice. Um, and that, in that sense, it makes it part of the resolution agnostic pipeline, even though you might end up with some blurriness. Um, back to the question about Houdini, um, definitely studying how it does um, some of its node-based user experience. However, the goal is to improve on the user experience because Houdini is a little bit esoteric and um, let's just say it has a, a high learning curve. And the goal for Graphite is, it, it, the singular goal for Graphite is to make it a approachable user experience that um, basically switches between layers and nodes in an equivalent manner, so you can actually completely ignore the node graph and work with the power of nodes, um, with most of the power of nodes in the layer panel. Um, and similar data types of that sort will also be part of it, um, but I think also the data types will be more useful out of the box than um, than the data types that Houdini provides, and also the nodes. All right, cool, cool, cool. It's always nice hearing where Graphite is going, and I think it's super exciting to hear that you guys are aiming for a uh, beta release coming out uh, in the foreseeable future, and so I'm definitely yeah, excited. One or where, two months. Yeah, where we can uh, see it go next month. So uh, there might be some more questions. Everyone listening, just, please, oh, to sorry. everyone listening, please join the development so we can make it one month instead of two months. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Expedite it. Yes. Uh, I'm going to uh, let you answer any more of the questions just in the chat, just so we don't run too far over time today. But uh, I'm excited to see you guys next week, uh, next month. Okay.
All right, so that is it for today's um, presentations. Uh, so I have a few announcements to add to the end of uh, the meetup here. So first of all, uh, the newsletter is out. Um, you can go check it out at uh, gamedev.rs. And so that's sort of just an update on everything that's going on in the uh, world of Rust games and Rust libraries and Rust learning materials and so on and so forth. So make sure to uh, check out what's been going on. Um, next up, uh, the I'm not sure which part of Rust, but I, I think uh, Nico is one of the people heading it up. Um, they have been recently running these cross-team collaboration fun time uh, meetings. I believe it's on the third Monday of every month. Um, the times vary just to, um, so more people can come out to them, uh, at, at least every other one. Uh, but this is just an opportunity for a lot of people who are working on a lot of different uh, teams within Rust to come and see what other people are working on. And so last month, there was a lot of discussion on um, air handling and uh, Nico gave a talk. Uh, I forget what the, the subject was, but it's, it's very cool to kind of be able to hang out with these people. So um, uh, Game Dev is a, uh, a team. And so uh, I went out last month and I think I might be doing like a small presentation there this month. I'm not this month. I'm not entirely sure about that. I'll check in with Nico, but um, it's still a, a great opportunity to kind of meet people in uh, that are outside of our, uh, uh, our Game Dev ecosystem. Um, so that's what I have for announcements. Uh, I did promise a uh, secret. And so uh, something I want to try this month um, is, let me just change my screen over here. Um, oh yeah, perfect. So I sort of just promoting some community stuff. Uh, Tan Tan, he's a YouTuber that makes um, some pretty cool videos and uh, a decent amount of them are about Rust game dev. And so I just wanted to end this uh, this meetup by playing his most recent one, which is a voxel engine um, and a lot of stuff about Rust. And so we'll see how it goes. Uh, he gave me permission to check it out. And so uh, we're all good there. Um, but until uh, next month, I, I hope everybody gets some uh, cool products going. Hey, I'm Tantan. Tan. Welcome back. I'm working on this voxel game and I recently decided to completely ditch the Unity game engine and basically reboot my entire game development process. It's for a multitude of reasons, but one of them is the Rust programming language, which I just miss it every time I use any other programming language. I feel like I'm growing as a programmer when I use it, and that is what I want to create my voxel game in. Lots